Good evening. Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to our third Longwood Seminar of 2015. I'm Angela Alberti, Communications Specialist at Harvard Medical School. This is my first year planning the seminars, and I hope you've enjoyed them so far. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you, or speaking to many of you on the phone, and I'm so grateful for your input, including your votes for this season's seminar topics. Um, also, for your continued involvement in the seminars, whether through your participation in our social media channels or through your attendance in person or via live stream. You continue to make this series a success. Before we begin the program, I want to remind you that our final seminar, Diseases Gone Global, will be held on April 28th, and we will make certificates of completion available at the final seminar to those who have indicated an interest and who have attended three or more seminars this year. If you won't be attending the last seminar on April 28th, please make sure that you leave your address with us at the registration desk or send it via email so that we have a way to mail your certificates to you. Although we ask that you silence your cell phones at this time, I want to encourage you to keep your phones on and join the conversation with other science lovers around the globe via Twitter by using the hashtags HMS, Minimed, and Music. Our email address and the hashtags are listed on the screen behind me up here. Tonight's seminar is called Music as Medicine, the Impact of Healing Harmonies. There is no human culture known that does not have music. Today, you might have streamed music over the internet while at work or at school. You might attend a concert this weekend or in wine with your headphones on while riding the tea home from this seminar. But the benefits of music extend far beyond entertainment. The 19th century writer, physician, and former dean of Harvard Medical School, Oliver Wendell Holmes, once advised, take a music bath once or twice a week for a few seasons, and you will find that it is to the soul what the water bath is to the body. Dr. Holmes obviously understood the power of music to soothe the soul. And tonight's presenters are going to one step farther to share with us some of the ways that modern medicine is harnessing music's power to help heal both the body and mind as well. Researchers across Harvard University are studying the tremendous therapeutic benefits of music, from understanding how it impacts the development of language skills in children, to studying its neurological benefits in elderly Alzheimer patients. Tonight, you will meet a few of the members of the Harvard faculty who are helping to explore the connections between music and medicine, and music as medicine. Our experts are Dr. Gottfried Schlag, who is an HMS Associate Professor of Neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Dr. Nadine Gobb, an HMS Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. But first, you'll hear from Lisa Wong. Dr. Wong is a pediatrician, musician, and author dedicated to the healing arts of music and medicine. An HMS Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Massachusetts General Hospital, she has been with Milton Pediatric Associates since 1986. In April 2012, Dr. Wong published her first book, Scales to Scalpels, Doctors Who Practice the Healing Arts of Music and Medicine, in collaboration with writer Robert Viagas. Dr. Wong plays violin and viola in the Longwood Symphony Orchestra and served as its president from 1991 to 2012. The orchestra is Boston-based and made up primarily of medical musicians dedicated to healing the community through music and combines music, medicine, and service by performing every concert to, to raise awareness and funds for medical nonprofits in the community. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lisa Wong. Thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I didn't realize that you were the ones who voted to have us here. So thank you even more for um, your interest in this topic. And thank you also to Angela for uh, organizing. This is a wonderful topic, the topic of the interconnections and the intersections of music and medicine. We've all been witnessing the healing power of music, whether 
it's in seeing the spark of recognition in a relative with dementia when they hear her favorite song, or quieting a child with a lullaby, or the relief of pain, even for a little while when a loved one is listening to music or clapping in time to a song. Just like the long-awaited spring, we've, we've been experiencing new awareness and new ideas about music and medicine, and a, a so much in, incredible growth in this field. And just like the New England spring, suddenly there's a momentum, new audiences, new connections, and things burst into flower with the knowledge of research and, and of uh, growing interest. So I'm a musician and, a, and dedicated to not only music, but to education, healing, and service, which is, it turns out is not unusual. As physicians, we're teaching all the time. We're teaching daily, even more so perhaps in an educational setting like Harvard Medical School. But all of us on a daily basis are teaching our patients. As pediatricians, we have the opportunity to make profound impact on families. We teach about nutrition. We teach about making good decisions, safety. And yes, I do recommend that they all start musical, music lessons even before they sign up for their soccer, soccer classes. I sing to them when they're on the scale, when I'm, they're being weighed, and I have them sing back with me when they're getting their shots, and it doesn't hurt as much. When they're playing their instruments, some of them have actually come to their, their exams and brought their clarinets and played for me. I remind them that this is a gift. The music is a gift, and it is a gift that one should give back. I'm reminded of Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who was himself an organist and a box specialist. And he became a doctor when he was 30 to go to Gabon in Africa to spend the rest of his life giving back through medicine. But he brought his piano with him. And when the, when the clinic was running out of money, he would go back up to Europe and play organ concerts to raise funds to keep the clinic going. So how should we look at this far-reaching topic of music and medicine? Music that gets under our skin, touches our hearts, and stays with us even when other cogni cognitive abilities start to decline. Let's use a technique that I learned from Professor Steve Seidel at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, who specializes in arts and education. As Steve puts it, the arts, and in this case music, can be seen through the lens of bifocalism. Music gives us the ability to focus on different aspects of an object through changing lenses, the big picture and the small, the single note, the symphony, the full orchestra. Those of you in the room with old eyes like mine probably know what I'm talking about with bi bifocals. In our discussion today, music is at the heart of education, service, and healing. And in order to frame our discussion, let's put on our bifocals and look at how music heals from the global level and gradually hone down to more specific work that's being done by my, my colleagues today on a more specific therapeutic level, because all of those are connected. On the surface, music and medicine seem to be at opposite ends of the spectrum, yet the connection is nothing new. The ancient Greeks worshipped Apollo not only as a god of healing, but also the god of music. And you can see he's leaning on not only the caduceus, the, the, stick, the, the cane with the, the snake on it, but also with his famous lyre, the, the healing sound of the harp, which can still be heard all over the country, but also including in several of our hospitals here in the Longwood Medical Area. This is a photo I took of a harpist playing for the children at Children's Hospital. The art of composing, practicing, and performing music for ourselves and for others is not dissimilar to the art of scientific inquiry. Hypothesis, experiment, and proofs in science, differential diagnosis, therapeutic trial, and treatment in medicine all start from curiosity and questions, utilize our discipline and mastery of technique, and reach a final expression of beauty. In his book, This is Your Brain on Music, The Science of a Human Obsession, Music neuroscientist Daniel Levitin writes that the work of artists and scientists is ultimately the pursuit of truth. 
But members of both camps understand that truth in its very nature is contextual and changeable dependent on the point of view. And isn't that true of music as well? Let's think about music as a healing art in society. Music is universal. It's played to celebrate the birth of a child, to mourn the loss of a loved one, and to embrace a union at a wedding. Music is used to educate, heal, and make new connections. Leonard Bernstein, in trying to heal the world, conducted Beethoven's Ninth Symphony at the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. Conductor Daniel Barenboim and scholar Edward Said created the West Eastern Devon Orchestra, an orchestra that brought young musicians from nations in conflict in the Middle East to learn to play together in harmony. And here in Boston, students from the music therapy department at Berklee College of Music connect by internet to share music every week with a community of former child soldiers in Uganda. In Venezuela, a country racked with poverty and income dis disparity, a vibrant program now known around the world simply as El Sistema, the system, brings daily orchestral training to over 400,000 children each year. Now in its 45th year, it is viewed not as a music program to train the world's greatest musicians, although that is a very happy side effect that is happening, but as a social program, a social justice program to heal society. Its founder, Maestro, Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu, has said that the main challenge in healing a society is to determine how to restore in the young an affluence of spirit, not an affluence of material things. In five cities in Venezuela, El Sistema offers music programs to children with special needs, to blind, deaf, and autistic children taught in the same daily intensive way. And poignantly, their teachers explain to me it is not their souls that are broken, just their eyes or their ears. When I revisited Venezuela in 2010, I asked, what happened to these children when they graduate from Sistema? While mu many of them do continue to be musicians, others become doctors and dentists. Over the past two years, Sistema has moved into two pediatric hospitals in Caracas, teaching music to children with cancer and chronic illness. And these children spend hours practicing because they have nothing else to do in the, in the hospital wards. And now they're incorporating, incorporating music into prenatal programs where the parents will listen to music and listen to performances, but also be taught how to care for their newborn child. Here in Boston and around the world, El Sistema has caught on, and there are over 100 programs across the country Right here in Dorchester is the Conservatory Lab Charter School, uh, where these children are um, blessed to be able to have two and a half hours of music as part of their educational program. OK, so let's change our lenses a little bit and take a little closer look at musicians themselves as healers. This, too, is not new. The words that we learn as doctors are musical. We're listen when we listen to sound, it's hitting our tympanic membrane our ear drum. And when we describe a, a patient with a certain respiratory illness, it's described as a staccato cough. And a cardiologist will describe the musical murmur of his patient as a crescendo or decrescendo murmur between beats. To this day, many, if not most, physicians have had musical training as children, and many continue to make time to play music throughout their lifetimes. Throughout history, musical physicians have been at the forefront of medicine and medical innovation. René Lenec, a physician in the early 19th century, invented the first stethoscope. But he was also a flutist who carved his own wooden flutes. And you can see that uh, it's not that much of a difference to just listen to one, one side of it and find that you can hear the sounds of the, of, of the patient's chest rather than blowing in it and making music. Dr. Theodore Billroth was chief of surgery at the University of Vienna in the mid-1800s. He's credited to, by all to be the father of abdominal surgery, having designed new procedures to treat colon cancer, esophageal, and even laryngeal cancers. During the day, he refined anesthesia, promoted sterile technique, and established a medical journal club for young physicians and students. And during the evenings, Billroth, who was himself an accomplished pianist, violinist, and violist, 
used a similar approach, but gathered prominent musicians of Vienna to his home to try out and discuss new and mu musical ideas, techniques, and innovations, most of which were written by his close friend, composer Johannes Brahms. Bill Roth famously said, the inspiration of living lies in the beautiful harmonies and sequences of our major and minor thoughts. Here in Boston, based in the Longwood Medical Area, there's an orchestra that continues the, the traditions of Bill Roth, Lenek, and Schweitzer, and all of the musical healers before us. The Longwood Symphony was established in the mid-1980s, which brings together 75 to 80 musicians from the medical professions to perform music at the highest level. But like Venezuela's El Sistema, they play music for social good, in this case, music for healing. We come from all the different uh, Harvard and other hospitals in, in the city. And young musician medical students find older attending mentors within the orchestra. Together they perform music, not only in concert halls, but in healing spaces. They found that families and caregivers look and see their loved ones in a different way when they see that their loved ones are responding to music. And one young physician later wrote, the experience of performing for these individuals as a physician was deeply powerful. I felt I was touching their lives in a very different but somehow related way. The Arnold P. Gold Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to humanism and medicine. It's best known for its nationwide white coat ceremony that welcomes young physicians into the community of healers. The Gold Foundation has identified seven qualities of quality for our young people so that they can aspire to these as they practice the art of medicine. These are the qualities of music musicians as well. Integrity, excellence, compassion, altruism, respect, empathy, and service. I would add that there is one more crucial word that we should add to this, which is collaboration. So let's change our lenses one more time. Here in Boston, we're known for our grit. We survive months of snow, we go for years without a World Series pennant, and eventually we emerge on the other side. We're pretty good at bringing good ideas together in new and creative ways. Boston is an innovation hub for medicine, and it's also a cultural hub for the arts. So it should be no surprise that Boston is also a significant hub for groundbreaking collaboration, research, and innovation in music as medicine. We study music's roles, and we bring together neuroscientists, musicians, music therapists in conversation with each other right here in the city. How can music have a role in addressing and balancing our lives? And how can music be used as, as a way to address some of the basic needs of our, of our patient populations in memory, movement, executive function, spatial relations? I'd like to now turn over the rest of the evening to two esteemed colleagues who can help us with understand this. Two of the top musician scientists in the field, Dr. Nadine Gabb and Dr. Gottfried Schlaug, both from prominent institutions here at Harvard Medical School. They'll bring us up to date with some of the newest knowledge about how playing, hearing, and working with music impacts us on a neurologic and physiologic basis and how it also can be used therapeutically. So adjust your lenses one more time as we welcome our colleagues, Dr. Gottfried Schlaug and Dr. Nadine Gabb. Dr. Schlaug is an associate professor of neurology here at Harvard Medical School and co-director of the Stroke Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He also serves as chief of the Division of Stroke Recovery and Neurorestoration and director of the Music, Neuroimaging, and Stroke Recovery Labs at Beth Israel. His main research interests are centered on ways to induce and detect in vivo brain plasticity in patients recovering from stroke or from dis developmental disorders affecting the auditory or auditory motor systems and in normal healthy subjects who are undergoing intense and long time training of sensory motor skills, such as learning and playing a musical instrument. 
Gottfried has published over 250 peer-reviewed manu manuscripts and more than 20 book chapters. His research has been supported over the years by several grants from N the NIH, the NSF, C CIMIT, Autism Speaks, and private foundations. And he forgot to mention in his bio that he is also a marvelous organist whom I, I've heard perform. And anyone who can manage to play with your feet and your hands at the same time and learn how to turn on and turn off all of those different stops can understand how Gottfried could write 250 articles and 20 book chapters. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Gottfried. Thank you so much, Lisa, for these kind words and this nice introduction, and thank you, Angela, and all of you for um, asking us to come and for organizing this. I hope I can get this to work. All right, um, one thing that I wanted you to take home tonight is that um, listening to music, and in particular making music, which has been identified as, as a, a more important way of engaging the brain and of actually leading to changes in the brain, that music is not just an auditory uh, sensation, but it's actually a multi-sensory and a motor experience that we have. Music makes us move. Music has emotions that it creates. And it has been shown in various research studies that music activates pleasure and reward systems in the brain. And therefore, we should be thinking of music as a, an extremely rich tool that we have that could potentially be used uh, to enhance um, brain function, but it certainly could be used as a tool in any kind of therapeutic session that we have um, with patients. We also know from various research that music making um, over longer periods of time changes functional networks in the brain, but also if it is done over long periods of time, changes structure in the brain and structural components of the brain. So the question for us was then, is music, if music making has these extra musical benefits, can it be used to heal, to regenerate, to repair the mind and the brain? And one experiment that I wanted to use to highlight how music listening or a musical task, and here it's a discrimination task, can lead to multiple regions in the brain that become active is this experiment that we did in various uh, groups of individuals. We started out with kids that were between five to seven years of age that had to do a either rhythm discrimination task or a melody discrimination task. And very young, musically unexperienced uh, kids treated this much more as a sound that they had to compare with each other. But the older the kids get, and certainly when you get into the adult stage, you actually see that exactly the same task now leads to various activations in the brain. Yellow usually indicates that there's a higher level of activation. So we see not only these temporal lobe activations here, so at the hearing centers in the brain to be active, but we actually see now activations that involves areas that are outside of the brain um, that um, have uh, involved so like more in the strategy actually on how to solve this task. So there may be regions that are involved in trying to figure out exactly what the sequence of these tones is, are. There are regions that may be involved in the memorization of the tones. And most importantly, there are regions in the front part of the brain that, have, that are related to mapping these uh, sounds to actions or to mapping these sounds to particular sequ uh, sequence um, in, in time. Um, one region in the brain that actually connects 
or one system in the brain that connects all of these regions that you see active here is a superhighway in the brain. It's a white matter tract that we refer to as arcuate fasciculus. That particular tract runs from the temporal lobe of the brain, the hearing part of the brain, to the frontal part of the brain or the region in the brain that is probably involved in sequencing of events, but most importantly for our discussion today, in the mapping of sounds to any kind of motor actions. And when you look at, at this image here that shows an occasional singer, somebody that, that may be an amateur musician, we see that these, uh, this particular structure is relatively similar. It actually turns out it's a little bit larger on the left side of the brain and on the right side of the brain. But then when we look at people that significantly train over time, we see this enormous enlargement um, both on the right as well as on the left side of the brain in professional singers. For them, it is very important to hear exactly what they are producing, to compare this to an understanding of how it should sound, and then to instruct their motor system to make corrections and to improve the mapping of sounds to actions, and in this particular sense, it would be articulatory um, actions. So this system, and here you see a schema of this, is called the arcade fasciculus, and I want you to keep this in mind because it will become important later in part of the talk. So this is a system that's critically important in perceiving sounds, in comparing sounds that is, that is coming in to something that we know or have already stored in memory, and then instructing the motor cortex to make potential corrections to our output. So you can imagine a system like this is important for any kind of language acquisition, either be it our primary tongue or a second language that we acquire, but it's also important for when we sing. And as I will show, it will also be important if we play a musical instrument with our hands. Now this concept of mapping a sound to a particular action was actually examined in the next experiment that I'm showing you here was done by my former postdoctoral fellow who is now actually faculty here in Harvard as well, Amir Lahav, who um, had this idea of teaching naive individuals who had no musical training to play very short melodies on a keyboard and then in a second task to have the notes or the individual pitches from these melodies reassembled into new melodies and just passively expose individuals to these new melodies. So the pitch and spectral information was exactly the same between those two conditions, but in one condition, individuals learned to associate a particular melody with particular finger action. In the other experiment, they were equally exposed, but they had not associated these melodies with particular finger action. Now, when we had subjects listen to these melodies in an MRI scanner, and here I show you the most critical comparison, if I can get my cursor there, um, the only region that showed significant difference between these two conditions, the trained and the untrained, so the one condition where melodies were associated with finger movements, and the other one where melodies were familiar but were not associated with female movements was this particular region in the brain that is in the inferior frontal gyrus that we think is critically important in mapping sounds to actions. And it is actually clinically very important because if we have a stroke or a lesion on the left side of the brain in this particular region, then that would render an individual as not being able to speak and we would typically call this as a progress aphasia, an inability to communicate. So that's how important these regions are in the brain that map sounds to actions. And in this particular case, in this particular experiment, it was finger actions, but we can think of this as well as, as um, mapping sounds to articulatory actions. So if music making engages and changes the brain, can it be used as a therapeutic tool to improve neurological impairments and disorders? There are numerous examples actually already in the literature. Some of them have been researched well. 
Some of them I will show you some examples of, and some of them really begging for research to be done so that we understand how it actually happens in the brain and we can potentially enhance our musical type interventions for these patients. So here's a list of, of things that, that I think has been um, where there's, there's more than just one case published in the literature. So we know that forms of, of music exposure, we call it rhythmic auditory stimulation, actually improves motor skill and gait in stroke patients. And a little bit more known is actually this form of rhythmic auditory stimulation uh, that is known to improve initiation and gait in Parkinson patients. We all probably have seen individuals that stutter, and if they sing, they don't seem to stutter anymore, um, which is a phenomenon that a lot of people have actually heard and are familiar with. How exactly that happens in the brain, we have no idea at this point, so that is the one thing that actually begs to be studied. Um, I will show you some examples of how a form of singing might help patients who have this, this form of aphasia, this form of broca's aphasia that I talked to you in a, um, in a few slides ago. And I will also extend that to a new group of individuals, of kids that have autism, but they have a particular form of autism that renders them to be nonverbal or minimally verbal autism, and how we can potentially use a form of this kind of music making of singing to help them develop some communication skills. And then Nadine may touch a little bit on this issue of um, how music could potentially be used um, in kids that have uh, language or phonological problems, or maybe not. Um, so when we, when we look at how, what can we do, what kind of musical interventions can be done in individuals that have suffered a stroke that renders them to have severe communication problems, renders them in a state where they can't actually express what they want, they can express the desire, we call them aphasic. Now, in order to understand this and, and how this actually developed, one has to understand that this, what we call the arcade fasciculus that I pointed out before, this superhighway that connects the hearing and the motor action centers in the brain, is actually through our lifetime becomes very developed on the left side of the brain. The left side becomes specialized in language processing and becomes very fast um, in, in doing these operations and so that becomes the leading part of the brain. However, the right side does have some rudimentary part of this. It can potentially do that too, which is actually a very unique occurrence in the brain that there is a redundancy built in we actually do not have that kind of redundancy built in for hand motor function. So if we wipe out a particular region in the brain that controls hand motor function, there's no way to actually restore this at this point. With language function, we have actually the other side of the brain that has a redundant system that can potentially be used to help us regain some of that language. So it's a very unique uh, situation that nature has preserved for us and that we are utilizing in this approach. So if this system here on the left side is kaput, then that individual cannot speak anymore or cannot speak in a fluent manner anymore. And I'm gonna show you a patient that, that is like this, and I've tried to block the identity here of this patient. I'm asking this patient to say the words of happy birthday, and then afterwards, I'll ask him to sing the words of happy birthday. Um, it's very difficult in the beginning to actually see and hear what the patient is doing because he stumbles a lot, but he basically perseverates on, um, on utterances that have no meaning, as you will hear, hopefully. Happy birthday to you. Can you say that again? Say that again. Yes. Okay. Can you sing it now? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dolly. 
Happy birthday to you. O and O. And O. So he perseverates on this um, syllables of N O N O N O, but he never actually really gets across what he would like to say, happy birthday. Um, now he is missing, his stroke is circled in here in red, and he is missing this part on the left side of the brain, the archive fasciculus, that would actually enable him to speak in a regular way. But he can sing. How is this possible? Well, our explanation for this is that he somehow learns through singing to particularly engage this rudimentary structure on the right side of his brain that allows him then to actually communicate, to express what he wants to say. And our task was, can we develop an intervention program that um, if applied to patients that are very similar, like this particular patient, that can be used to enhance verbal output, to enhance fluency in patients after stroke. And I can't show you all of the patients that we have done, but I can show you a few examples of this. This here is a patient who was in his 60s, um, had a relatively bad stroke, and when we asked him initially, when we interviewed him, when we asked him conversational questions um, in our interview, we asked him also what his name is, and he had already trouble actually saying what his name was. So, okay, sorry, that, that movie doesn't work. Um, when we scanned this individual patient, um, we were particularly interested whether or not we find, would find any differences um, in the activation pattern in the brain, particularly on the right side of the brain. And I want to draw your attention to the stuff that I circled here in green. We asked these patients to say the few words that they can say in the scanner, so always the same words, before and after our intervention. And what you can see here after the intervention is that there's more activation an additional activation on the right side of the brain. And most importantly to us, and probably as a way to facilitate the improvement that we saw, which was long lasting, is that this particular structure here, which is the arcuate fasciculus, was rudimentary in the beginning, but then after a relatively long type of intervention, which is at least 120 hours over several months, we were seeing a change in the physical structure of this connection between the right and the left side, between the hearing and the motor action or the motor doing regions of the brain. Um, we have another patient that was relatively young, and I want to highlight this as well because the younger patients are, the more plastic their brain seems to be and the more likely it is that we'll actually see a change not just in behavior but also in the brain. So this patient was not even 12 years old uh, when she had her stroke and she came to us a year or so after a stroke with not showing a lot of improvements. And here we interview her before the treatment. Do you know what happened to you while you had that yes. stroke? Um. Uh, park. You were in the park. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and dizzy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. When was that? What do you? She's basically at the single word level. Um, she understands our questions, but she can certainly not really engage in a conversation. And this is how she sounds the same question after therapy. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what you remember and what you know happened um, when you had your stroke. I went to the cape. And I went to a park, and I got dizzy. So she can actually tell the story. She is grammatically correct. She is fluent in all measures that we have. And that is completely unexpected, because if you would look at her brain, she basically has no left side of the brain. She can't speak through that left side of the brain. The only way that she can speak is actually through the right side of the brain. Now this was a very unusual case, because it actually turns out that she has a monozygotic twin. Exactly as old as she is, exactly the same genes. So we were able to actually not only scan her 
over time, before and after treatment, but we were also able to scan her sister as a control before or over time to, actually, to make sure that the changes that we would see in the brain would not just be developmental changes over time, okay? And most important here, when you look at this structure here, which is the arcuate fasciculus, this white matter superhighway, they change quite dramatically over the various time points that we had. And in, in her sister, there was not much of a change. We had other structures in the brain that we didn't think were as much involved or they were not as trained as much. They didn't change really as much over time and so did, they did not do in the sister. And if we quantify this, again, there was a very significant change in the structure of this, in the, in the components of the structure that, um, that was supporting her speech output. Let me very briefly, because I'm running out of time pretty soon, um, touch on how we can extend this um, intervention to another population that has, uh, has dysfunctions as well in verbal communication, but so like really belongs into a completely different category. And these are children that um, are on the autism spectrum, but are actually a special category of children on the autism spectrum, those ones that are minimally verbal. Now, we know that the individuals or the, the kids that are minimally verbal make up about at least 30% of all autistic children. Um, there's hardly any research actually on these on these children because people like to study autistic individuals that are sort of like a little bit higher functioning and that are easier to deal with. Um, so we don't have any specific therapy that is being tried right now to see whether or not we can enhance um, verbal output um, in this population. Um, turns out that children with autism enjoy musical activities. So we developed an intervention that was similar to what we have done in the stroke patients, but this particular intervention actually used both hands, used musical drums to see whether or not we can teach the individuals, and in particular teach the brain, a way of associating sounds to actions, and we actually meant articulatory actions using hands to facilitate that process. And you will see some of that. So this was our first um, child that we actually did like this. And you can see how challenging that actually was in the beginning, because this child had really no meaningful verbal output. Oops. Hello. Hello. Okay, wait, there's too much. Yeah. Hello. You should just sit in the chair. Just sit in the chair. It's a relatively structured program, although it doesn't sound quite like this, but we have a phrase that we present in a sung form to um, the subject. Uh, we use two drums to do that. We have a picture representation of that phrase, and then we take the subject through a very structured program to actually um, get exposed to speak with the examiner or the therapist and then to repeat on their own. And we were basically ready to give up because we couldn't get him to make any sounds until about the 12th session or so. And then all of a sudden we got this. It's time for... these kids like to say bubbles. So um, that's one of their first words. So obviously this was one of the ones that we used and this actually after about 12 sessions or so finally came out. After about 40 sessions um, he was able to almost have a conversation. Um, so here he is we asking him what his name is. What is your name? My, my name is Mami. 
he still sounds somewhat apraxic in the way that he communicates, but at least like he understands the question and he has some verbal output. Um, I'm going to have to rush a little bit. Um, you're going to have to believe me that there are more kids like this. <laughs> Not all of the kids um, are, are stars like that first one, but almost all of the kids that we have done so far, we get them to make some sounds, to make some sounds that are speech relevant sounds um, so that they can express at least like some of their basic needs and wants. Um, I'm not sure if I have. Maybe not. Okay. So I was going to show you some stuff on Parkinson's as well, but we can probably talk if you have any questions about this. So to conclude, listening to and making music is a multisensory experience. It makes us move. It creates emotions. It gives us pleasure and rewards us. We know that it changes the brain. And having such a tool that is so rich in its sensory stimulation in the way that it connects sensation to the motor system would obviously be ideal to put into any kind of rehabilitation um, session um, because it not only is a rich stimulus, it also makes use of some of the intrinsic brain connections that we are endowed with. Our brain is built around this concept of connecting sensory regions and perceptual regions with motor regions, with action regions um, of the brain. And on top of this, music has the added advantage that it is an emotional stimulus, that it touches us in particular ways, and that it combines all of this by triggering pleasure and reward system in the brain. So I'm very grateful to all the people that have contributed to this to the patients that we had participate in this and to the various funding agencies that have given us money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gottfried. That's, that's such exciting uh, information, and it's things that we're going to be continuing to hear more and more about. So th thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is Dr. Nadine Gabb. She is an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital right down the street, and a member of the faculty at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She received her PhD in psychology from the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and she did her postdoctoral training at Stanford University and at MIT. Her current research within the Laboratories of Cognitive Neuroscience at Boston Children's Hospital focuses on auditory and language processing in the human brain and its applications for the development of typical and atypical language and literacy skills. So this is leading directly from the, the, the um, work that we've been just hearing about from, from uh, Gottfried. The GAB lab utilizes structural and functional MRI as well as behavioral measurement tools. The GAB Lab is currently working on various topics such as the identification of possible pre-markers of developmental dyslexia in the pre-reading and infant brain, the identification of underlying neural mechanisms of comorbidity of developmental dyslexia and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is all such interesting stuff, especially for a pediatrician. So we welcome Nadine Gab to our uh, podium. Um, thanks a lot for having me tonight. Um, I will talk about linking music, language, and executive functioning skills. Um, I want to address three open questions tonight. The first question is, how are music and language linked? The second is, could music be used as a diagnostic tool for language-based learning disabilities? And the third question is, could musical training enhance other cognitive functions other than language and reading, critical for language and reading developments, such as executive functioning? OK. So 
So this is a paper we published um, many years ago where we tried to summarize um, the influence of music and how, uh, to what kind of skills it relates to. And what we could um, find in the literature is that there are many studies that show that musical training and musical aptitude improve or are correlate music processing. So like melody, rhythm, timbre, harmony as well as general auditory processing, such as pitch discrimination or pitch memory, or temporal processing, like rhythm, which is not that surprising because it's music and it's within one domain, the auditory domain. However, there has been a lot of evidence that music, musical training, musical aptitude is related to language and literacy skills, such as reading or phonological awareness which is the ability, ability to manipulate the sounds of language. So for example, I would ask a child, say the word banana without b. That's the ability, if the, the child can say this correctly, the answer, that would be the ability to manipulate the sounds of language. But also verbal memory or prosody perception. So we were really interested, what could be the underlying mechanism that explains the link between musical training and better language and reading skills. So I want to start with a short timeline on reading development. Reading development happens or starts in infancy with sound and language processing. So the first really fundamental steps of the development of literacy skills come through your ear. After that, in preschool, early kindergarten, kids are learning phonological processing skills, phonological awareness. I just explained this, the ability to manipulate the sounds of language. And they learn to recognize letters. Beginning of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, the child has to learn to map the sounds of language to the written counterparts. So that's the mapping of the graphemes onto the phonemes, and the phonemes onto the graphemes. They then learn to read single words, connect the text, and then the ultimate goal of reading development is to read fluently and to comprehend what you read. For speech, tens of milliseconds can change the meaning of a world. So here you see two waveforms, and they are identical except for an inserted 100 millisecond silent gap um, here, yet we hear two different words. We hear say here and stay here. It's exactly the same, so you have time here and amplitude here, but we inserted this um, gap that makes you hear two different words. Children who learn to read have to manage and learn this and then map the sounds of language that are changes that have changes in the millisecond um, units onto the written counterparts. A long time ago, Paula Talal and colleagues showed that children who have language and reading problems have something what she called auditory sequencing um, skills that are impaired. What she did is she played two tones, two pitches, one really high pitch and one really low pitch, and there was a gap between the two tones. The gap was sometimes really, really fast, eight milliseconds, and sometimes relatively long, 4,000 milliseconds. And she asked the kids which tone came first, the high or the low tone. When the gap was really, really small in between these tones, the same scale than a phoneme or a syllable that I just showed you the slide before that makes say into stay, then the kids who had language impairment and reading impairments had a very hard time telling um, the um, experimenter which tone came first. However, if you make this longer, they had absolutely no problem anymore. So they didn't have a general hearing problem. They just had problems processing these really fast sounds within, um, with their auditory system. There's another researcher, April Banasich at Rutgers University, 
who could show that these rapid auditory processing thresholds, these skills I just described, in seven and a half month olds actually predict their language comprehension at age three. So that they, they, they seem to be very, very critical for language development and very, very critical for reading development. So we came up with a working hypothesis. We don't want to call it a theory, it's a working hypothesis, which is maybe musical training improves basic auditory skills, auditory skills I just described to you, which then leads to improved auditory skills related to language. And I explained to you um, the say, stay, for example, which then improves general language skills, which then improves reading skills. And this is a working hypothesis that you can easily test. So the first study that I brought uh, tonight looks whether musical training or musicians have improved auditory skills related to language. We did the study in 28 adults. 14 had intensive musical training. They played in orchestras, were trained musicians. And the groups were matched for IQ, gender, age, and general language abilities. So we could make sure that none of these variables influences our results. What we did is we created syllable continua. So what we did is we created this syllable here, which is a clear ba. This is a spectrogram. You can see that at 800 hertz, that's basically what the, the, the hertz for the first um, sounds bit of the syllable. We also created a clear da. And here, the only difference, they are almost identical, except for this really, really rapid beginning here, where this begins at 800 hertz, and this begins, begins at 1600 hertz, and it makes you hear two different syllables. What we then did is we created all kinds of in-between syllables. They sounded a little bit like, more like a da, a little bit more like a da, and so on. So these were in between syllables, many, many steps. We then played for the musicians these two extreme cases and said, are they the same or are they different? And they said they are different. And then we changed the syllables and it became closer and closer and we determined the threshold. How much does a syllable have to change in order for you to perceive it as different. Here we have a spectral change. The only change between this lies in this initial sound bit. However, we can do this with a ba wa continuum, where you see here, this here is a much shallower beginning of this rise here. This here rises, um, the duration of this rise here is 25 milliseconds versus almost 100 milliseconds. That makes you hear ba versus wa. But also ga versus ka, where you just insert, similar to the say and stay example I showed you earlier, a silent gap. So we hypothesized that if musicians are especially good with these temporal aspects that I described to you earlier of language or of, of uh, auditory skills in general, then they would be much better discriminating the, the two syllables that had a temporal change, a temporal component to it. This is exactly what we showed. So we could show that there were significant effects for ba wa and ga ka, where the syllable had to change a lot less, just a tiny bit, in order for the musicians to per perceive them as different. But we didn't see any difference for ba da. So we concluded that musical training is associated with a heightened sensitivity to temporal acoustic cues in speech. And this opens a whole new box of possibilities. So the finding provide implications for the potential of music-based interventions in benefiting individuals with language-based learning disabilities. In particular, music-based interventions that emphasize temporal structure may improve language and processing abilities. So the next question I brought for tonight is, could music be used as a diagnostic tool for language-based learning disabilities? 
And that's a study we did in collaboration with a group in Brazil. And I'll tell you how this happened, and I hope they're listening tonight. So um, Paulo, one of the authors here, is, oops, this is not working anymore, or here. Um, he's a music teacher at a school um, done in Brazil, and he also likes music cognition, the link between music and language, but he's not trained, he has no psychology degree or statistical knowledge, etc. But he observed something really, really interesting in his classroom. And he said, I'm so interested whether, you know, this is something. And I contact this researcher at Harvard, and she probably never emails me back, but I'll just give it a try. And I read the email, and I explained to you what he explained to me, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. We have to start a collaboration. And so for the last five years, they were just here last summer. Even though Brazil World Cup was happening, they traveled to Boston during that time and uh, visited the lab. And so we've been doing a lot of collaborations. So that's what I um, truly call neuroeducation, bridging neuroscience and education. And his wife is uh, also very involved in this. So what they did was they had 45 students, and the children were between six and eight years old, and they were all native speaker of Brazilian Portuguese. And they did a variety of cognitive and language skill testing with them. There's no standardized tests available in Brazilian Portuguese, but they adapted this and looked at reading, especially reading speed, reading accuracy, writing, phonological processing that I just explained to you. So phonological awareness, phonological processing is actually one of the best predictors of reading outcome in preschool and young children. They looked at verbal work, uh, working memory, etc., And they developed a task which we then called the music sequence transcription task. We couldn't find a shorter name. <laughs> and what it is is, and I show you a video, is Paolo plays um, on his guitar always four chords. There is a thick sound, that's what the kids learn, and a thin sound. The sixth sound is played on the low register of the A chord, and the thin sound is played on the high register of the A chord. They learn to associate one symbol with each chord. I show you how this looks like. Okay. So he plays four chords, and then the children are asked to write down what they just heard. So some kids had the perfect score. Okay, so you can see here that they write the line here for the thin sound and the O for thick sound. So this child here has the perfect score, getting auditory sequencing right and always writing down four symbols. However, he noticed that there were actually 22 students who showed superfluous responses, we called it. So what they showed was they actually wrote down a lot more symbols than the chords they heard. I have to mention that he never says, I'm going to play four. He just says, I'm going to play these chords, and I want you to transcript them, write them down. So these kids always write many more, sometimes less, but most of them many, many more. And he realized, while he talked to his wife, who also works at the school, that the kids who actually write more sounds than they were, <coughs> were the kids that had language and reading problems. He contacts me and said, I want to see whether there's a relationship, whether we could use this to actually identify children at risk early. And we did this. We used some fancy statistical analysis that we don't want to describe tonight. But what I'm telling you is that this task was associated with reading speed, reading accuracy, completion of reading, rhyme detection, reading pseudo-words, which requires a lot of phonological processing, and word sequencing. <coughs> also, this task measured in second grade predicted fifth grade reading and writing abilities. 
None of the other tasks, except for phonological processing, predicted as good fifth grade reading and writing abilities. So our results indicate a significant relationship between this task and linguistic abilities. Performance on this task relates to reading ability and phonological processing. So we think that children who showed these superfluous responses actually have problems with tracking regularities in the auditory input, auditory sequencing, or perceiving the unique elements of the auditory gestalt. And so we think that this may be a convenient and feasible tool uh, for early detection of children at risk, especially if you have a lot of children in the classroom who are English as a second language learner, especially in countries where no standardized test is available, so you have no idea where they are on the spectrum. And if you need to test many, many students at the same time, if you don't have the resources to do one-on-one -on -one testing. So to update our working hypothesis, musical training may improve auditory sequencing skills, improve perception of auditory gestalt, which then improves auditory skills related to language, improve language skills, improve reading skills. So, but is this the whole story? We thought, no, it cannot be that easy. So we were interested by the musical training enhance other cognitive functions critical for language and reading development. So we thought maybe musical training could also improve something that's very unrelated to auditory, basic auditory functions called executive functioning skills. And this, we don't think this explains the whole relationship, but it could be a, a parallel, a parallel way that um, enhances the relationship. So executive functions are capacities that allow for independent, purposeful self-regulation behavior. Task shifting, shifting from one task quickly to another, inhibiting something, um, and, um, paying attention to, to something else, goal-directed behavior, or cognitive flexibility, which is if you have a lot of different rules and you have to quickly change between the rules. Executive functioning abilities are very in indicative of uh, academic and social readiness of schooling, even more than IQ, uh, math literacy, standardized testing. And there's a strong link between executive functioning and reading. So what we did is we tested the adults and children. They were again grouped based on and matched based on IQ and socioeconomic status. And we did a battery of executive functioning skills in these groups. We could show that adult musicians perfor performed significantly better than non-musicians on a variety of executive functioning measures, especially cognitive flexibility, which is quickly, change, uh, quickly adapting to changing rules. We also saw this in children. We also saw verbal fluency um, as one um, um, executive functioning skill that was significantly better in children and adults with musical training compared to their peers. We also looked at the kids' brains. So the way we do this at Boston Children's Hospital is we have a fake MRI scanner. We invite the children and they can climb on it, run around, press all the buttons, learn a lot about science, learn a lot about the brain. And then they practice some video games in there. And then once they're comfortable, we actually bring them upstairs and start measuring um, their brain in the real brain camera. And what we could show is that here on the top, this is um, uh, um, children without musical training while well, they do a task where they quickly have to switch between rules compared to a task where there's only one rule. And you see that here in the front, that's activation of the prefrontal cortex, or what, what I often call it, the CEO of the brain. It does exactly what the CEO does in a big company, like all these executive functioning skills. This one here are children with musical training, and this is the difference. You can see that the children with musical training had more activation in these prefrontal areas that we know are associated with executive functioning skills. 
So overall, our results support the working hypothesis that executive functioning may be one of the mechanisms mediating the often reported link between musical training and heightened academic skills. Intervention studies based on music and rhythm offer additional benefits for children with language and reading difficulties. However, more longitudinal studies and interventions are needed in order to examine a possible causal relationship. Okay? It's really important that we have to emphasize that we don't know what the egg and what the hen is. Okay? We don't know whether someone has really, really good auditory processing skills and that's why they become a musician, or whether the musical training actually improved their auditory <laughs> processing skills. We have some hints. So for example, in our executive functioning um, study, um, the amount of musical training the children had was associated with their executive functioning skills. That's indicating that there is a link um, uh, uh, between musical training and executive functioning and that it's not predetermined. It's important to consider that replacing music programs with reading or math instruction in our nation's school curricula in order to boost standardized test scores may actually lead to deficient skills in other cognitive areas. So a lot of school districts eliminating music, a lot of um, more standardized testing is happening in our schools, but maybe we are eliminating exactly these um, uh, curricula that are important for very basic cognitive skills. Okay, a special thank to my graduate students and especially the collaborators in Brazil um, and the Grammy Foundation and the William Milton Funds. And if you're interested in participating in our studies, this is the link, and we also have um, recruitment material out there, just show you so that you recognize this. So you can either um, sign up online or you can send, fill out this card and post it, and we add you to a database, and if there's a study you're eligible for, your children are eligible for, then we're, you will hear from us. And hopefully I'll see you soon in the lab. Thank you. Okay, well, this is wonderful. Um, I hope you are as excited and learned as much as, as I did. And I want to thank um, Dr. Schlag and Dr. Gab again for their wonderful presentation. So let's give them a round of applause. So we've got lots of questions. And if you um, have any other questions, please feel free to write them on the, your index cards and pass them to the um, uh, to the to the sides. Um, one of the questions that came up several times was um, on the type of music um, that people listen to. Does a type or style of music matter to brain function? What about tempo? And what about electronic music versus uh, instrumental music? So I'll open that to both of you. I think for interventional studies, it does not necessarily matter what type um, you would use. What probably matters is whether or not you have a relationship to that music. So if that music is something that you like to listen to and that music has a particular connection to you, then that's probably a richer stimulus to use, a more relevant stimulus to use. Um, for some types of intervention, we want to stress more a melodic pattern. For other types of intervention, we want to have more a rhythmic pattern. And there have actually been people that have looked at the, um, the, the, the prevalence or the, the importance of rhythm and beat in music. And there's something which is called a groove index, where you can actually define on how 
salient the beat is in, in music. And it turns out that the more salient the beat is in music, the more we hear that beat in music, the more that actually makes us move to that music. So if you are interested in in coming up with some music that one can use in enhancing gait or any kind of movement, then it's probably important to look for that type of music that has a very strong beat and where you perceive that beat very strongly. Yeah, we do think that um, for the study I presented with the executive functioning skills, um, no one has done this yet, but I, my hypothesis would be that you actively have to play a musical instrument because to think about um, what someone in an orchestral setting has to do and what kinds of executive functioning skills there are. There's a lot of inhibition, rule shifting, um, 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 paying attention to one thing, ignoring another, uh, selective attention, etc. There's a lot of these skills that you need to do when you, for example, play in an orchestral setting that you may not have as much when you just listen to the music sitting on your couch at home. Okay, um, and actually, Dr. Gab, I have a question for you that links to my interest in the El Sistema program. Those are uh, impoverished children who have um, come from all over Venezuela, and they start at a very young age and are in a very intensive music program. So is that the sort of model that you might think would be a good experimental model where it doesn't control for, uh, it, there, there is um, a wide range of, um, socioeconomic um, status as well as IQ. Um, and the only thing that's common, the common um, constant is their music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really great. I think what's important is that um, one controls for socioeconomic status because um, it's a given fact that children coming from um, families that have a little bit more money have the money to actually pay for music lessons. And so the difference between some um, a musician and a non-musician may be just simply how they were brought up to and not necessarily uh, the music per se. So I think we have to control for this. And this is a perfect example how one can control for this. There are several questions on preventive medicine. Is there any research um, about preventing or minimizing illnesses or conditions rather than using music for treatment? And I think actually, um, Dr. Gab, your work is, is, is talking a little bit about uh, preventive because you can start using the predictors so early in life. But Dr. Schlaug also, do you have any um, comments about that? Um. Well, there's, there's several ways to think about this. On one hand, as what Dr. Gab already pointed out, that music making, certainly in childhood, is an extracurricular activity frequently, although we would like to have it in school as well. It is an extremely rich stimulus, and therefore it will enrich our life. It will uh, make us connect senses with motor actions. It will enhance learning strategies and how to approach how to learn particular aspects. Um, it will, you know, approach very different aspects um, of life. Um, there have been a few studies that have looked at musicians over time, and particularly if musicians um, age. Um, I also like look at this more from a perspective of people that actually have music in their life, that make music in their life, um, but not necessarily are um, professional musicians, when you look at, at these individuals over time, then you find that there are certain brain processes that are enhanced longer in life. There may be some preservation of gray and white matter that is longer in life. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to control some of these studies because you would have to come up with another intervention that individuals would do throughout their life to really make the point that it is musical intervention or musical activities and not any kind of other activities. It's probably any kind of other activities um, would, be, would have that kind of an effect, but music has something special to it because it touches us in a particular way, it invokes emotions, it plays with our reward and pleasure systems, 
And because of that special role, um, and music is very frequently not just made by a single person, but we make music with a group, so it enhances also group activities, group communication, synchronization with others. So music is unique, I would say, among all of extracurricular activities that, that you could do. And because of this, it probably will have some benefits with regard to our brain and when we age and when we try to preserve brain function, but that is still something that's difficult to prove without any doubt. Uh, moving a little bit further back in the in the age spectrum, uh, can the introduction introduction of musical training in children who are struggling with issues of executive function be helpful for the teenage years? Um, and I don't know if this question. I think this question can be looked at it two ways. If they have musical training as young children, is that preventive? But also, can that be used in children who have issues uh, in their preteen and teenage years? Yeah, I think uh, no one has looked at this yet, um, but I think it would be really interesting to take a look, um, especially um, in children uh, or teens who, ha who's, uh, who have problems with um, attention, like attention, ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. So um, yeah, I think for sure, um, but that's something that to my knowledge has not been looked at yet. Um, this is an interesting one on, um, on movement. Um, this is for Dr. Schlag, but some melodies seem to compel us to walk or move in, in harmony to the beat. When one walks down the street, hearing such a rhythm, one can almost help move to the beat, but could this be used therapeutically in strokes? And I know you were, you were going to uh, show us a little bit about um, um, some other work that you're doing, so I'm gonna give you that opportunity to, to show us that video now, if, if that's possible. Yeah, so one of the oldest way of actually showing that music might potentially be uh, beneficial that has been researched for the longest period of time and has been shown in various groups and by various labs to actually work is if we, I don't know if we, so, okay, yes, is actually something which is called rhythmic auditory stimulation in Parkinson's as well as in stroke patients. So basically what it does is it uses music that has a very strong beat. The beat has to be in a particular relationship to the cadence of, of the way that you walk. Um, and that's sort of like a little bit the secret that every lap sort of like keeps on what that relationship exactly is. Um, but it sort of like seems to work. You can reduce um, the variance, the step variance, and you can actually reduce the fall. What research is still going on is um, how strong does that beat perception has to be? Does the effect last beyond when you actually listen to the music or do you always have to listen to the music in order to have that kind of an effect? And there's actually one person that put a, a video of the effect um, on the web and this is so um, obvious that I thought I would show this to you because it is the best example of, of how this might actually work. So here is an individual that is, by, by everything that we know, seems to have Parkinson's symptoms. Um, and he sort of like walks first in his living room, then he turns on the music that you will see will have a very strong beat, and then almost you will see a different kind of a person that is now walking much easier and much more um, elegant um, as he was walking before without any kind of hesitation or freezing. There should be sound. Let me try this. All right, so now you heard it without sound. Let me see if I can take this back.
So at this point there is no sound. He's trying to walk and you see he freezes. He has this dystonic posture of one hand and then he walks a little bit out of the camera, turns on the music. Thought that was great. Um, I, I hear that there are also um, some therapies where people can actually wear headphones, <clears throat> listening to music as they walk to to help them smooth out. There's also dance for Parkinson's. Again, the music is overriding the um, the, the 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 rigidity that uh, is part of Parkinson's. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked, how is mu how does music play a role in the deaf and hard of hearing patients and individuals? And um, I just wanted to comment about this about when I went to Venezuela, there was a chorus there called the, the Chorus of the White Hands. <clears throat> and these are children who are deaf, who are wearing white gloves, and they are signing in, in, um, in rhythm with the conductor in front of them, standing next to a, a chorus of deaf children, of, of blind children who are singing in four-part harmony. And um, from seeing each other and, and sort of picking up verbal cues and um, and, and sight cues, they're, they're sharing the knowledge and it's, it's a very moving experience. And we're told that when these children um, get cochlear implants that their speech comes in more easily and it's possible because they're signing in, in complex rhythms that they're already learning the rhythms of speech. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, and uh, that, that question is, um, whether listening, singing, composing music yields the same therapeutic effect, or um, and what kind of instrument does an instrument matter, or is it really that we really should just sort of embrace music and and um, and all play? And a secondary question to that was somebody who said they had studied the violin from uh, a young age and quit in college, and is wondering what happened to their arcuate fasciculus at this point. It's gone. <laughs> so um, the, the studies we did with the adult musicians and the syllable task, uh, we did not uh, see an effect of a musical instrument, um, but it was a relatively small group, so I would love to um, look at different instruments and see whether this would make um, a difference. Um, but I think what's really important is did you play the instrument you like and not because you think it makes your awkward fasciculus bigger. <laughs> and um, I think you should, you know, have your children and, and adults um, play music because they enjoy it and not because they you know, have a bigger awkward fasciculus later on. I think that's really important to keep in mind. And I think I would, I would add to this that, that there is research that has shown that the active engagement in making music uh, might be better than just a passive exposure to listening to music. Um, but I think we should never forget that um, the, cheapest the cheapest musical instrument that we actually have is in ourselves, and that is singing. Uh, we don't have to buy it, we can just um, do it. And um, it can be done by ourselves or within a group, and it has tremendous effects. With that, I, I uh, thank you both for your wonderful uh, words, and thank you all for coming.